getting to the right, the right answer is more important than the speed. Making sure that we look and overturn every rock is more important than just coming forth and giving a document. ISIS, Obamacare, climate change, all buried in the news cycle this week as a nation turned its attention to the city of Baltimore. It's where we are forced to begin in this edition of the arena. So let's get to work. First up, she is advisor on LGBT policy and racial justice at the Center for American Progress. It's a pleasure to have Danielle Moody Mills here on Midpoint. And he is the veteran economist whom we consider the money master. Welcome back, Steve Beeman. I thank you both for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure, Ed and Danielle. It's a pleasure to meet you. Let's get to it, guys, Me because too. we have some developing news here now out of Baltimore. And this is coming from ABC7 News, which is WJLA television in Washington. According to them, they are citing multiple law enforcement sources saying that the investigation into the death of Freddie Gray has found no evidence that his fatal injuries were caused during the videotaped arrest and interaction with police officers, according to the sources. And again, sources, one station, the medical examiner looked at the injury of Freddie Gray said when he slammed into the back of the police transport van apparently breaking his neck that that was caused by his own actions and a head injury he sustained matches a bolt in the back of the van. Danielle, we're starting to get a lot of this in. It's coming in. It is not authoritative at this point. It is all just source material. But you and I have to agree. I think we all agree. We still don't know fully what happened, and we have to get the real answers and stop making judgments on source material, correct? I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, the fact that we still have police officers investigating themselves is also part of the problem. But getting this circumstantial evidence and these alleged sources from this place or that place, that's not you know, how we're going to get to the bottom of the story. If the police would open up their records of the events that took place and investigate the gap of 45 minutes or the 30 minutes in the in the van ride to the police department, then we could get some concrete answers. Well, but we and do we know, unfortunately, though, that as sources. an investigation goes forward, Danielle, you can't just open up your, all your records. You can't just make everything public because you do have to have an investigative process, correct? You do have to have an investigative process, but the fact that they have decided to, in fact, seal the records and not let anyone know, not even the family. I don't even say that, hey, let's open it up to the entire public. But if you could at least let the family know. But isn't that the smart the, thing to do, Danielle? Understand the though. coroner's records about what happened. That would at least let us know that they are very much interested in getting to the truth. But isn't that the smart thing to do? And, and Danielle, I'm going to come back to you on this, but I want to bring Steve in on this. Isn't that the smart smart thing to do because I have said it on this show many times and also I've said it on the hard line at night. I've said you must be able to finish the investigation. You've got to be sure you get this right the first time. You can't make a mistake in this. Steve, you can't just let information flow out there because that's what creates riots, unrest. It creates people thinking that there's cover-ups. Am I, am I being a little bit too Pollyannish here? No, I think you're on the right track. That You and I spoke about this when it first happened, and the reality is the police and the entire judicial system has to get this right. They can't leak things out piecemeal, little by little, to make people make interim judgments. We have to get it right. I mean, to Danielle's point, we do want to make sure that the investigation itself is complete, but we don't necessarily want to open it up just as we don't with any investigation. Don't we have to then just make sure that we... As a people, but I mean, and I've, and I've taken the media to task, my own uh, business, if you will, here. There are some people out here who are fanning the flames of this. They're just pouring gasoline mm -hmm. on it. They're saying that, wait a minute, why don't they bring out the information? Why don't they let it out here right now? Why are they taking so long? Matter of fact, I'm going to name names. Chris Matthews from MSNBC, uh, Mika Brzezinski from MSNBC, Chris Cuomo from CNN. Same people asking these questions. Guys, we're not criminologists. We're not law enforcement officials. You have to shut up, give out the facts, and wait until everything is in before you make a judgment. Danielle, how am I doing on this so far? Because don't we all just want the truth? We all do want the truth, and I think that you're absolutely right that the piecemealing of information that's coming out is more harmful than it, than it does good. And so the idea that we're even getting these kind of source information dribbling out into the press, I'm wondering who is leaking that, right? Like if there is this tight sealed well, see, investigation there's the next question that's happening, too. And, and I think then your we, point's need, to, well we taken. need to keep it that way. I think your point's well taken. Steve, 30 seconds before we take a break here, but let's be very honest here. There could be a cover-up 
happen here. So you have to worry about what's going on at all times and where this information is coming from. You got to look at it from both sides. That you got to look at it from all sides. And Ed, you've accused me before of always coming back to money, but I'd like to see who's making money off of this because they're going to be responsible a lot for an awful lot of this fanning the flames. And not only that, but you have, <laughs> you know, I hate to say this, but there are people out there using this as promotional to be able to say, here are the riots, here's what we that's saw. A fact. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, that's mm -hmm. insulting to me because that simply doesn't help the issue by, any. By the way, Ed, I think it's insulting to a lot of the people in Baltimore, which is why they've come out now and said, let's settle this down. Yeah, well, th th this is yeah, all part that's of not, it. It's not journalism. It's sensationalism that's is, the what, point. is what's happening right Thank now. Thank you very much, Deal and Facts. Please stand by just a moment. Daniel Moody Willis and Steve Beeman, we got to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what you put on Facebook and why it will land you in jail. Much more to come on Midpoint. Next part of the arena kicks into gear. She's an advisor on LGBT and the group there to have Danielle Moody Mills join us. And veteran economist whom we consider the money master, Steve Beeman, joins us. I thank you both for being here. Let's get to this first of all, Steve, on this is we talk about the social issues that we have here in America and the problems that we have. In East Point, Georgia, a woman named Ebony Monique Dickens goes on Facebook and posts basically the fact that she is going to kill cops. Not that she thinks about it, but she wants to. And she puts freedom of speech, though. So when you can absolutely show me in the First Amendment where it explicitly says you can't say kill all cops, then I'll delete my status. Other than that, nope. Well, guess what? They went in. They arrested her. She bonded out. I think it's absolutely perfectly done. You get somebody like that, I think you've got to go after them. I think it's justified. It's not the first time we've seen it. The reality is all of us who've grown up in this country know that free speech is not an absolute. You don't have the right to go into a crowded theater and yell fire. That's the old example. This woman, you know, her argument was I was just ranting, but she was extremely specific. I'm going to go do it now. And it puts it into another category of insightful speech. It's not free speech at all. I think the magistrate in this case was exactly right with what they did. Danielle, there's another point here because people have got to Realize that when you use that phrase freedom of speech, there are still consequences to it. It doesn't mean that you can just go out and yell, you're going to kill somebody, you're going to hurt somebody. There's a problem in this country here, Danielle, where not only somebody believes they can say that, but they can post it on social media, get away with it, and be so arrogant about it. You know what's really interesting is that our laws still haven't caught up to our technology and where we are right now. And so, yeah, we don't really, this is the first time of a case I've heard about where a judge has said, well, now you're no longer allowed on social media. And um, is this going to be the new trend? Because people say a lot of offensive and horrible things all over social media. Um, will all of them be hauled into, in, into court? I don't know. But I do think that it's a really interesting case. I don't think that it, I do think to Steve's point that it was kind of insightful. I want to kill all these cops now, right? When we did see that happen play out in New York. And that happened over social media, a young man taking pictures and, and then getting there and then actually killing two cops. So I, I'm, I'm interested to see how our laws are going to catch up with where we are right now in our use of technology. They're going to have to catch up sooner or later. I mean, the lawyer comes out and says, my client was simply venting. It was a horrible mistake. She was venting where it actually took her fingers the opportunity to go there, type it out, and hit send, and hit post. That's not venting. That's a threat. So let's wait until we see what the lawyers do with this. Uh, here we go, lawyers on this one. Uh, Sophia Vergara's ex, Nick Loeb, uh, speaking out about the frozen embryo dispute. Danielle, this is fascinating if you think about it. Nick Loeb and Sophia Vergara, they have frozen embryos together. They signed a contract that says what will happen to these embryos if and when they split, if something happens. Now he says he was coerced. He wants his embryos back. I excuse me, Danielle, isn't a contract a contract? I do think a contract is a contract. Um, I, I don't understand. Like, if he signed a contract, how is he coerced, right? And how is he going to prove that? Because that's going to be up to his lawyers to be able to prove the fact that he was, in fact, coerced. But if he signed a contract and they agreed that neither, if they broke up, neither one of them were going to use it or they, it was just going to stay on ice, you know, until the end of time, then that's what they agreed upon. And I think something about this just doesn't feel right to me. And it feels very much like he is looking for some type of media attention or something. Well, it's fascinating if you think about this, Steve, because we're opening up a whole new legal avenue here because now you have frozen embryos, which some people will say are the beginning of life. They are sacrosanct here. They deserve to be protected. So you can't just destroy something just on a whim. 
Well, there's no question we're opening up a legal can of worms here. In fact, I was looking around for my lawyer hat that I could stick on. <laughs> but um, I, well, you know, put I your money con- hat too on because there's a lot of money in this in this business it's as well. Be, it's and, going to be enormous, and the contract law here has to prevail. I think, yes. but it does get down to this question: Who owns your DNA, and what rights do you have to it? Can you sell your DNA for profit? <laughs> These are questions. You know, it gets mm-hmm. back to even that social media when technology is moving ahead at the speed of light. We've got to let our laws catch up. Yeah, and we also have to agree. Well, look, we're not going to say that this is happening, but who knows if you have somebody on one side who wants to have the children, bring them to term. Look, Sofia Vergara is worth millions. I mean, here we go. Steve, we're always talking about millions here. You never know what somebody's ulterior motives are here when it comes down to this. And this is a human life we're dealing with. I get accused of being cynical, Ed, but I was raised on the notion of follow the money. And on something like this, it's very hard for me not to follow the money and think there's an ulterior motive here. Danielle, would you think that maybe there's ulterior motives in here or just somebody who's, I mean, you even mentioned the fact that you think he might be just trying to get another 15 seconds of fame and all this, but do you think that he really wants the children here or is just something, does he want to get involved in Sophia's bank account? To Steve's point, yes, I think that that could also be um, an alternative motive here, that she is worth millions of dollars. If he says, oh, I want to have these children, then is it up to the courts to say that then she owes him child support for those kids? I mean, that is really interesting legal waters that we're treading into here with the idea of frozen embryos, contracts, and I think it does come back to money. Ten seconds, Steve. Well, what is the value of her brand name on those children as well? So he could claim, oh, these are the children of, and therefore he bred them into a money situation. Ladies and gentlemen, we proved again that, as Steve said, it always comes down to money. Hang tight, everybody. (laughs) We're going to take a break, come back, and deal with more right here on Midpoint. All right, one more go around. This time we're going to go from the ridiculous to the sublime, and I mean that. Uh, First of all, she is advisor on LGBT policy and racial justice at the Center for American Progress, Daniel Moody Mills, and veteran economist, the money master, Steve Beeman. Danielle, I'm going to begin with you on this one because these stories are all connected. First, in France, the French media reporting that a 15-year-old Muslim girl in the northeastern French town of charleville mezire was banned from class twice for wearing a skirt that was too long. Not too short, too long because they called it a conspicuous display of religion. That's worrisome. Wow, that is incredibly worrisome. And the French have a really interesting relationship with the Muslim community. Um, and by interesting, I mean incredibly tense. So that but maybe to me, that's why, if you consider I, that I don't tense really relationship. Say, I don't really say. They, I don't think that you should be able to tell somebody that their skirt is too long. But think I, about I don't that think for that a that's a, How but is that say, offensive? Well, they're calling it a provocation. I mean, Steve, to say something like that is a provocation, I mean, that says something about not just the French, but society in general, where we're going, because they're saying now that just the clothing itself can provoke somebody to hate a person and to perhaps hurt them, injure them. And, and I, I can't come up with any other word but frightening. Uh, I think you're, we're on a slippery slope here that's really Very. dangerous. Um, to Danielle's point, this says a lot about society, and it's a dangerous thing when you start to look at the issues France has had with the Muslim community, and not the majority of Islamic people there, but a fringe of it. And this is a response to that, trying to eliminate religion from the public square. You can't wear a cross in school, obviously. The question is, is this kind of outfit an outward display of religion? That's a really dangerous thing. But it ties into another story that you talked about, which is a young girl getting kicked out of school for wearing a spaghetti strap. Ah, wait a minute. Hang on there. That's coming up a little bit later. Don't get ahead of the host, Beeman. It's very bad to do that. Let the host get to it. Danielle, here comes the second part of this. Here's a young lady, Morena Brasino. She's a high school senior. Muskegon High School. Mm -hmm. Her mother went out with her, bought the prom dress. Matter of fact, the mother took a piece of paper with her and said, here's exactly what we can and cannot buy. She looked at it, the guidelines. It said, backless dresses are acceptable. The girl buys, and here's the dress. And to me, I'll tell you, I think she looks looks wonderful in this dress. It's sexy, but it certainly isn't offensive whatsoever. She was in the prom for an hour, and then the vice principal comes up and says, you got to get out. Now, this is worrisome because when you follow the guidelines and then somebody gets to make that sort of a decision, Danielle, again, you're leaving it up to a person's individual mores to basically decide what somebody else can and cannot do. 
Right, and if you have guidelines that say no, you know, no backless, no strapless, no what have you, um, and somebody is following those rules, and then you just decide to pick them out of a group and say, I don't like what you have on, I don't think that that's fair. And no, she should not have been asked to leave. And that's so detrimental to someone's development. It, prom is a big moment in, in any kid's life, and so to be turned away, um, that's just terrible, yeah, based on somebody else's idea of what they should or shouldn't be wearing. I think that's it. You have the rules, somebody follows the rules, you then don't make up your own rules as we go. One minute left, Steve, I'm going to come to you now because here's the story. A Texas man, his five-year-old, I should have saved that, a five-year-old girl goes to school. The school said no spaghetti straps had to cover up her sinful shoulders and legs with a t-shirt and jeans. Steve, stop me. She's five. Well, Ed, I've got four daughters, and my daughter actually brought this story to my attention this morning, long before I knew I was going to be on with you. It's got these kids up in arms. When my daughter was five years old, I guarantee you on a warm day, she wore things like that. They're applying, you know, these high school dress codes to these kids. This is just another example of ridiculousness in this intolerant situation we have in the schools. It's just ridiculous. I only got 15 seconds left, Danielle. She's five. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more things that we should be focusing on in school <laughs> and not a little five-year-old shoulders. Thank you. Maybe educating her. Thank you. How about educating her and not making her feel like she's done something wrong when all she's done to go to school, she's cute as a button yeah. and, and good for the father going after somebody like that. Boy, I'll you tell you, it. we need more help on this. That's what we're here for. Danielle Moody Mills, Steve Beeman, pleasure to have you both on the show. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you both again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. See? It's just all about everybody calm down, but that's what we do every day because that's why we question everything. Rock on, true believers. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here on Friday for the next edition of Mid.